Hey there everybody, welcome back, I'm Chili. Let's get this show on the road. Today we're talking about some physics bullshit. So that means math, but nothing too complicated. I promise to be gentle. Now you can't talk about physics without talking about our good old friend Zach. Or Isaac Newton. Isaac Newton? Yeah, that's probably how you pronounce it. Anyways... What am I going on about? I'm going on about the second law of motion. And that law basically means that the speed of acceleration... Acceleration is the rate of change of the velocity, right? And that rate is proportional to the force. You push something twice as hard, it's going to accelerate twice as fast. And it's inversely proportional to the mass. Something is twice as heavy is going to accelerate twice as slow. So that's represented by this formula, F equals MA. Which is um, a little easier to understand if you rewrite it as... Wait a minute. I hope I have the right layer here. Not that it matters. Acceleration is equal to force divided by mass. You increase the force, you're going to accelerate faster. You increase the mass, you're going to accelerate slower. Now, our system as we have it right now uh, doesn't do this. It just calculates acceleration directly. It just has delta V values that it adds every frame. Because we have a ship, right? Wait, that's not the ship. The ship looks like this. Yeah. You got a ship, it's got, you know, thrust, which is your force, and it's got the mass of the ship. So that doesn't change. Acceleration is always just going to be uh, m over f. So we might as well just pre-calculate a, and then add a into v every frame. Right. But, if we want to do some bullshit with different forces different forces that act on our ship and maybe different ships that have different masses so you've got like ship 1 here which has M1 and you've got ship 2 here which has M2 and they have different they have different uh, thrust forces and maybe there are different black holes with different gravitational forces you do all that different shit you can't just pre-calculate your uh, your delta V's your accelerations because it's going to be different for different ships the acceleration for this ship towards the black hole it's going to be different than for this one. Well, maybe the same. But anyways, I'm getting I'm getting sidetracked. We have to we have to get force and mass into the equation here if we're going to have different masses, different forces. So, we're going to need to upgrade our system to calculate Basically to uh, take into consideration Newton's second law of motion. So we do what we normally do. We sync up with the remote server. Wait. And wait. And wait, 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 wait. Syncing. Pulling the current branch. Jesus Christ. I'm going to get a drink of water. Oh, we, ha we have success. Okay, here we go. And then we want to go to branches, and let's get a new branch. What do we got here? B-hole, that's what we want. Let's create that motherfucker. There we go. And let's look at... The history. Okay. So the first thing I changed I made here was I refactored circle and ship... To add forces, basically Newton's second law, drag, and remove the max speed. 
So before I had it where the speed was uh, capped at a certain maximum speed. The, the velocity vector couldn't be longer than a certain length. But I've changed that. I've added drag into the equation, which is a natural way of capping speed. We'll get to that in a second. Uh, even though it's not, it doesn't make sense in space because there's really not enough, you know, particulate matter to uh, have any appreciable drag effect. But there you have it. So why do I do? Why do I do? Okay, so I added a new class here called Physical Circle. And Physical Circle has a mass, uh, it has a velocity, it, and it also uh, inherits from Collidable Circle. So let's go to Collidable Circle. Collidable Circle has what? So it's got a radius and it's got a position. So it's no longer just uh, an empty shell for some virtual functions. It's not. It's no longer just an interface. It's now an actual class that holds the radius and the position. So that stuff is not going to be carried in ship anymore. Uh, ship is going to inherit from physical circle, which inherits from collidable circle. So collidable circle is just a circle in space, and it can represent anything. It can represent a region that triggers an event, or it can represent, for example, the region of the black hole, which, uh, you know, causes a force to act on any physical circles that come within the region. So, collidable circle, and it implements a bunch of bullshit here. Test collision, you can test if you collide with a, full, with a collidable circle, obviously. Get the aligned axis bounding box, get the radius, get the center. That's fine, that's fine, that's fine. Okay. Now, physical circle inherits from collidable circle, and it adds a bunch of bullshit for Newton's second law. So it's it represents an actual physical object, some kind of mass that's moving around in our simulation. Uh, so it has mass, obviously, and it has to keep track of its velocity from frame to frame. This VEC2 here is going to store the net uh, sum of all the forces acting on the mass at any uh, given frame, so you can calculate the, the delta V, the change in velocity in that frame. And the drag coefficient, this just represents uh, how fast the... Uh, the physical circle slows down in space or you know the drag it experiences it's kind of like wind resistance or air resistance although there isn't any air in space we use it anyways because otherwise the ship would just keep accelerating into infinite speed and that would be really freaking hard to control so yeah we just, you can there's a bunch of getters to get some information get the mass get the velocity uh, you can apply an impulse, which is a direct change in velocity. That might happen, for example, if you rebound off a wall. It's not a gradual change, it's an instantaneous change. So that's an impulse. Uh, you can apply a force, which is, you know, that in will induce a gradual change, like, for example, thrust or gravity. And update here just does the, uh, you know, the standard updating bullshit. It's not that complicated. So, for the concept of our system, we have a collidable circle and inheriting from that physical circle and then inheriting from that ship. Now, collidable circle, one thing that I'll inherit from that would be, for example, wait, undo that. Black hole. 
Now, why isn't black hole a physical circle? Well, black holes, they don't have velocity. They don't move around. They just stand still in one spot. They don't, they aren't affected by gravity. I mean, they are in real life, but I mean, even in space, a black hole isn't going to budge much once a ship you know, passes within its vicinity because it's way freaking heavier than the ship. And so the, for, per, for the purposes of our game, it's just a static object in the environment that acts on other physical circles. So the black hole derives from collidable circles. Other things that might derive from a collidable circle might be, for example, uh, I don't know, like a trap. It's a trap! Some kind of environmental trap that might slow down a ship or something. I don't know, man. Bullshit like that. Or like a circular region, kind of like our uh, track region, only circular. Things that might uh, inherit from physical circle besides a ship. Uh, you might have like a rocket. Which is, you know, a piece of, kind of like a bullet that flies through space. And bullets might be affected by black holes. They might be able to bounce off of, or they might explode when they hit walls. They are going to move. They are going to accelerate based on their own thrust and maybe some gravitational forces. So they're physical. They will derive from physical circle. That's the idea. That's what we've got here. So physical circle. And what else? What else? What the fuck is that? A collidable circle. It's up here. So what other bullshit? I think track region manager. Yeah, we just change this one to uh, test collision with a physical circle. And I remembered it now. Before collidable circle, uh, it had all these uh, virtual functions, and some of them are kind of specific to, uh, for example, track is very specific to only ships. It's not going to count for other kinds of physical objects in this in the region, like, uh, for example, maybe enemies or missiles or bullets or, I don't know, other bullshit. It's only going to count for ships in a race. So it's kind of dumb to have this virtual function that's only going to be overridden by one type of overrider and everyone else is not going to care about it. So instead of having it as a virtual function in here. What I do is tracking. Let me just see here if I can find it. Because I think I put it in ship directly. Here. So I. So I made track in non virtual in ship now. It's just a standard function. And in order for track region to handle that, it has to cast the physical circle to a ship uh, in order to determine, in order to use that function, right? Because track doesn't exist for physical circles, so you have to cast up to ship, and then you can call track. So we use something called a dynamic cast, and I don't think I've covered this before, so new C++ topic incoming. Prepare your butthole for this knowledge bomb. That was gross. I apologize. So, how dynamic cast works is uh, it casts to like a, it can cast to a member that is lower down in the hierarchy. So if I have a pointer, let's just get back here. If I got a pointer to a physical circle, I can cast that to a ship. And then, you know, call ship functions and whatever. And it will check to make sure that that cast is actually proper. Now, I'm not exactly sure how dynamic cast works, but I believe if it fails and you're trying to cast to a pointer to ship from a yeah, physical circle pointer, if it fails, that pointer will be null. But the thing about uh, references is they're not really allowed to be null. It can happen, but it's not, it's not a state that is uh, proper. Whereas, you know, null pointers are perfectly fine as long as you don't try to dereference them. Null references are just 
bad. Bad mojo. So if you try to cast uh, to a you know to to a member that's higher up in the hierarchy, and it fails, like let's say we're trying to cast this physical circle point or reference to ship, but it's actually uh, referencing a rocket. We can't check to see if that's null because it's a reference. So what we do is we can catch the C++ runtime will throw an exception and we can catch that exception and then handle it. So the exception that is thrown is a bad cast, right? Because the dynamic cast, we're trying to cast to something and it doesn't match up. And so if we catch this, we just uh, assert true. Basically, we give, um, you know, a debug error message saying, Something fucked up, and here's where it fucked up. So this is how you can uh, cast up and check to see if it works. Now, the way that the system is going to work is we're going to have... Uh, what is this, track region? We're going to have all the ships in their own vector, right? They're not going to be mixed up with other physical circles. So we're only going to be testing ships against the track region. So this should always work. It should always work because we're never going to be testing anything other than ships. But that being said, we should still write this code just, just in case we do something stupid. It'll catch it for us. So just in case we make some mistake and end up testing, you know, missiles against the tra track regions, it'll let us know, at least if we're in debug mode. Uh, so yeah, that is that so try catch you put the code that you, all the code in here that can throw the exception has to be enclosed within a try and then the catch that follows is where the code will jump automatically uh, when it catches that error I want to talk more about uh, exceptions later on maybe but for now all you have to understand is that this is how this works I don't use exceptions that much, but I am considering maybe putting them to better use in the future. There's a lot of, uh, I don't know, ickiness, a lot of uh, uh, trepidation associated with using exceptions. Uh, it can cause a lot of problems, especially if your memory allocation, your... Uh, resource allocation is initialization stuff RAII I believe that's what it is if that isn't up to up to snuff then you can have memory leaks and bullshit when you throw exceptions because when an exception is thrown you jump out automatically you pull that you pull that bullshit out right away and if you've allocated some dynamic memory that you want to deallocate later on in that block and you jump out through an exception, you will not deallocate it. And that's where things like smart pointers come in. Um, but anyways, that's, that's, that's another story. I just wanted to do this so that I didn't have to have that dumb virtual function cluttering up my collidable circle. So I did it and it was good. And so yeah, that's that. That's that track region that's fine ship what did you what have you done for me lately now you're driving from physical circle instead of collidable circle yeah some changes there some changes there uh, so here uh in the update we check if we're thrusting and if we are we apply force and that replaces all of this stuff over here this was the acceleration code. Now we just apply a force. And at the end, when we're done our update for ship, which has to do with rotating the ship and thrusting, then we call physical circle update, which actually calculates the Newton's second law stuff. All right. Uh, polyclosed rebounding. Change some dumb names. Polyclosed. Change some names. Change some names. Change some names. Uh, physical circle. So.
So yeah, here's update second order motion. That's that's the Newton's second law stuff. And here's just uh, updating the uh, the position based on the velocity. Uh, yeah, so all the forces get applied and they accumulate in net force. And after they've accumulated in net force, then velocity is updated by dividing net force by mass, time multiplying by the, the time step. And after that's done, we reset net force to zero again so that it can, you know, because if you didn't, the force would just keep building up and building up and you'd fucking blast off into infinity and beyond. All right. Now here is where we apply uh, the drag force. Air resistance, basically. So air resistance, all that is, is basically velocity squared times some coefficient of drag. Uh, and this is what will stop our ship from, you know, going too fucking fast. And what will also allow it to glide to a stop. So you've got... Ah. Yes. You've got some object... Oh, good. I have turned off my pallet. There we go. Got some object. You apply a force to it. And that's going to cause the velocity, which is blue. Right? Red is force. Velocity is blue. So you apply a force, and that's going to cause this one to gradually increase, 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 increase every step. And it just keeps going faster and faster and faster and faster and faster and faster and faster and, faster and you get the point. Now that would be in a perfect vacuum and that would be ignoring, you know, relativity and stuff like that. Special relativity? I don't know. Anyways, but if you've got some kind of resistance, what's going to happen is, well, let's get, in, let's get an equation here. So F drag is equal to negative uh, velocity and we're not going to use that as a vector, we're just going to use it as a scalar, just the, 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 the scalar value of your drag. It's going to be opposite direction as your velocity anyways. So drag is equal to, we'll put the negative, velocity, absolute value of velocity squared times some coefficient. And the coefficient depends on the cross section of the object, the shape, like a tier shape is very aerodynamic, right? A big, a big old block is not very aerodynamic. And things like that. So, like, for example, the density of the air or whatever, you know, thing it's flying through. A whole bunch of bullshit is going to amount to one coefficient. But the general f form the formula takes is quadratic. So as velocity increases, you're going to get... Uh, let's say the drag is yellow. You're going to get a tiny little thing in here. That's your drag. Now your velocity increases a little more. Drag's going to increase a little bit. Your velocity increases at the same, almost the same rate. Your drag increases a little more. Because it's a square, it's going to increase at a bigger rate as it goes on. Now, this drag is going against this force, so your increase in velocity is actually going to get it smaller. Your drag is going to increase, and your velocity is gonna increase is going to get even smaller, just a little bit. And now your drag is going to increase, but since this increased only a little bit, this one's also going to increase just a little bit. And eventually, this is going to equal this, your net force is going to be zero, and your velocity is going to be constant. 
So in a graph, that would look like basically like this. Something like that. Where this is your, your terminal velocity. And this would be your velocity if there were no drag. It's a linear, linear increase based on the force and the mass. But you get this because of drag. Drag gives you this. And then when you turn off the force, it's going to look something like this. And it's going to be asymptotic to zero again. It's going to keep approaching zero, but it's never quite going to reach it. That's how drag works. And that gives us different behavior than we had before. Not necessarily better, and I'm not, I haven't decided what's going to be the best for uh, um, control, what's going to be the most fun, most interesting. But this one is a little, it's, it's a way of limiting your maximum speed that's a little more natural. It's not just uh, an abrupt um, stop of acceleration once you reach some maximum. It's an asymptotic approach. It's more gradual. And it has more of a basis in actual physical reality. So I decided to add it in, but I'm not sure if I'm going to keep going on with it. And that is that. Allow us to continue. So that was one of the biggest changes that we had. Let's look at some other changes, shall we? Where's my, where's my history? Here it is. All right, thrust force. What is this? That's just changing the thrust force. I guess I was tinkering around with bullshit. B hole started. So I added uh, this, which is a B hole graphic that I created. That's that's a picture of my B hole. If you would like to know. Uh, what else? What else did I do? Well, I created a black hole class. It derives from collidable circle, not physical, like I said before. You draw it. It's just your basic uh, textured quad. It rotates, so it has an angle, and it has an angular velocity. Makes it more interesting. Uh, what else is there? I don't know what whole scale is. I think that's just scaling the image on the the map. The texture. Min distance. I think this is probably the, the minimum that distance that you can use for the gravitational calculation. And K gravity is a K is a uh, a constant for the gravitational attraction. So Newton's law of universal gravitation goes some big constant g, the product of two masses. If you've got, you know, a mass A and mass B, the force that each of them feels, F, which is an equal force, is equal to the product of their masses divided by the distance between them squared times some constant. So you can say that this would be equal to k times m1 over r squared, where m1 is equal to the other, the mass of the thing that's being sucked in. k is just equal to g times m2. They just take those two constants, suck them together, and then you divide by r2. So this is equal to the force that would be applied to our ship. This was the ship's mass. This is some constant... Um, which basically determines how strong the black hole is, and this is the distance. Now, as it turns out, in my code, I forgot to add this in, so it's actually just f equal to k over r squared. It still works, but it's not, it's not good. If you, don't, if you have multiple ships of different masses, it'll give you bad results. Uh, they won't be consistent. So I'm going to have to add uh, m1 into here later. But anyways... That's another story. So, so, what do we have? We have handle collision 
and virtual override. And it just gets the, the displacement, the R. Uh, this is distance squared, or R squared in our formula. And we check if the R squared is less than the radius. I, I don't have to do this, but I do it anyways. And the reason I do it is because when ships collide, or when two circles collide, the distance between them is actually R1 plus R2. But I only want to start gravitational attraction when the center of gravity is within the radius of the black hole. So that's why I do that extra test. It's not really that important, but I do it anyways. Probably just another symptom of OCD. And here I make sure that the minimum distance isn't less than 1. Because remember, we're dividing by r squared. So if r is much less than 1, our force is going to be huge, which will like fling the ship like way out into space. So if the ship and the black hole are really close, we just we cap the uh, the distance to a minimum of one to prevent huge numbers like if distance was zero you'd be dividing by zero and that would give you bad mojo all right so what do we got here we get the we calculate the distance we cap it off at the minimum and then we apply the force in the direction with the, the constant gravity divided by distance squared I should, what I should have in here is constant gravity times mass of the ship divided by distance squared. But, whatever. Whatever, dude, doesn't matter. Still gives us a good result. And collidable circle. Because physical circle depends on collidable circle. So, in order to have collidable circle take physical circle to break that uh, circular dependency I had to break it out into its own CPP file like this that makes sense collidable circle what do you got that's new all right before it was in here it took a collidable circle collidable circle but now test collision takes a physical circle which makes sense because collidable circles can't ever collide with other collidable circles. If it's only a collidable circle, just a standard collidable circle, then it's not going to collide with another standard. It has to be physical with just a collidable. Some bullshit changes here. Add the black hole. And added a function in matrix Three to extract, uh, extract the translation part of a transformation matrix. So I don't know why I added that. Added a get norm function, which normalizes and returns a value without changing the original thing. That's good. Next. Okay, here's something useful that I did, which I should have done earlier, which I planned to do earlier, but then I forgot about it. And that was, you see, in ship, we had all these loose, you know, uh, loose vertices and bullshit in order to draw a textured quad. And I've pulled all that shit out and refactored it into its own class. So the textured quad is now a graphics type entity, just like, uh, for example, triangle strip. And so it, you can get a drawable from it. And you got a bunch of bullshit that you can set to scale the image to a certain size in the world. And yeah. yeah so you load a texture quad with a certain scale and a certain center of rotation. Zero, 00 defaults as the center of the image, but you can modify that. And then you draw it, which is just the code that we had in the ship before. So now ship will include 
instead of all this shit, it just includes a textured quad. As does Black Hole Sun, won't you come? Okay, I just wanted to. I've been waiting to do that this whole episode. And wash away the rain. Anyways, I apologize. Uh, more changes to values. So apparently this K gravity, I think I made, I think I had a bug somewhere. Something wasn't working properly. And this value wasn't actually being used. And when I changed it to work, I realized that the value was too low. So I made it really big. But I can't remember what I did. What was the error? Oh, right. So I was taking distance squared as the minimum of uh, min distance squared, which is 1. So the minimum of 1 and the distance. So if the distance was greater than 1, it would just be the minimum. It would always be 1. So it was calculating the force as if I was 1 pixel away from the black hole which was really fucking close. And so even with a very low gravity, I was getting a huge suck-in. And what I noticed was the suck-in wasn't changing even if I got closer and closer to the black hole. I was like, why the fuck isn't this working? This isn't working the way I suppose. And that was because the fucking distance was always just defaulting to one. So I should have, this should have been a max. It should have been the maximum of one and the distance. So that the minimum would then become one. See, it gets confusing. To make the minimum one, you have to take the maximum of one in the distance. Anyways, this is not the first time I've made that mistake. And it always fucks me over. But I decided, fuck it. You know what? The black holes are going to be outside of the uh, ring. I don't know. Well, maybe later on they will be in the ring. But for the, uh, the bullshit that I'm doing now, the black holes are outside of the ring. And so you can't actually get that close to them. So I just removed the minimum distance thing. Just made it simply apply the force. And I applied a bias. Uh, which is calculated up here, I think, or somewhere. I don't know. Bias. It's calculated right here. Well, I calculated it here too, but I just didn't use it. Anyways. Um... The bias. It's taken longer than I wanted it to, but it's a more interesting topic than the last one, so I'm not too worried about it. So the force, the gravitational force is, you know, it's going to be some constant over R squared. It's going to depend on the, the mass of the ship. But the mass of the ship doesn't change, so it's just constant in the end. And it looks like this. Right, It's asymptotic. As you get very close to the black hole, it approaches infinity. And as you get very far from the black hole, it approaches zero. It never touches zero. It never reaches infinity. Well, I mean, if you actually are at the exact position of the black hole, it will be infinity. But, um, in general, it's not going to get to infinity. And it's also not going to get to zero. But, in our game... Our black holes are modeled with, uh, like, let's say this is our track. And here's a black hole. Black hole. No, I'm just, I was just joking. I'm not going to do it again. Now, it's going to model by physical circle. The radius of the physical circle, like the black hole, will probably look something like this. Okay, that's the image of it. But the actual physical circle's radius will be like this. And that will depict the region in which the black hole will operate on uh, ships. We could make it so that all ships are always getting the forces from all black holes, but that would... It probably wouldn't be a big deal, but if you had a large number of objects in and a large number of black holes, that would add up to, you know, a lot of calculation. So I'm limiting it to only... Uh, only objects that are within a certain distance from the black hole will experience its force. And as long as you make that distance far enough, 
that'll be pretty close to the uh, zero force will be pretty close to the actual force you feel, which will be very little because you're far away from the black hole. But it'll still be non-zero. So let's say that the the force experienced right here is equal to this. That means that ship is traveling, ship is traveling, getting closer and closer to the black hole. And as soon as it hits this point here, its force that experiences is going to jump up, immediately jump. And that discontinuity is what I don't want. So what I do is I subtract a bias so that the distance, or wait, the force experienced at this uh, cut-in distance, this cut-in displacement, will be zero. So what you'll get is you'll get something that looks like this, maybe? Because you're subtracting bias from here, so that will that will have that bias distance. Yeah, why? What is this? What the fuck is that? Uh, undo. Undo. Oh, good. Okay. So by Im implementing this bias, now force is zero, 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 and then it increases from here. Not just in, uh, a sudden jump in force. That's what the bias does. It's not a big deal. It probably, you probably wouldn't even notice it if it weren't in there, but I added it because it was something I thought of, and I thought, that's cool. So, I burped, by the way. Oh, it smells like pizza. Yeah, I've, heard, I've smelled worse. Okay, now, here, remember I talked about when you use objects in containers, you have to be able to assign if you want to sort them or use other algorithms on them? Well... It looks like I've made surface so that you can move a sign. So here's the move constructor for surface. Where's the move assign? Uh, here it is. Here's the move assignment operator. So I implemented a move assignment operator. And in order to do that, I've also in order to do that, I've had to take out the draw string functionality from surface. Or at least I thought I had to, but I think now I didn't have to do that. But my, my thinking at the time was if I can find... So if you notice, I've taken out all the stuff that has to do with GDI+. And the reason is, is you can't move... You can't use move semantics on these objects because they they don't support them. They were you know they were developed before C plus plus eleven. So I figured since you can't move bitmap and you can't move graphics, what I would do is I would basically factor out the uh, the text drawing code into a new class called text surface that derives from surface, and this class would not be assignable. So if you see here. Uh, the assignment operators delete, delete, and the move constructor operators also delete. Uh, so I make it impossible to, you know, move or assign this surface, but because I've taken that out, I can now use uh, assignment, move assignment with the surface. Now that I think about it, all that I had to do was when I did a move assignment, instead of trying to move the old bitmap and move the old graphics, just forget about them and create new bitmap and new graphics in the, uh, the class that will get the move assignment. Although, now that you think about it, once you have a bit... Okay, so I couldn't do that anyways. Never mind. I'd, this was necessary, is what I'm trying to say. Because if you're doing an assignment, you're doing it between two classes that already exist. And so if I already have my embedded bitmap object existing, I can't change it afterwards. I can't remake it or anything. So that's why move assignment doesn't work with text surface. But, which is the standard surface now, I'm able to do move assignment. So I can move 
assign the contents of one surface into another, which will be useful because surfaces are contained within, um, uh, what do you call it? Textured quads, right? And textured quads are contained within entities which might be contained in containers, like for example, a container of ships or a container of black holes. And I'll want to be able to use algorithms and shit on them, therefore they'll have to be move assignable. So this was necessary, I think. And I did it. I also got rid of this save function. Moved it down here. I don't know anymore. Why did I move this down here? Oh, I just moved it to... Alright, because surface from file is load. I just moved save into the same place as load. Whatever. It's not important. Alright. So yeah. I just basically separated surface into two different classes. A basic surface and a text surface, which has the ability to have text rendered to it. And that is all. And here I just changed from surface to text surface. And here I changed the system buffer from a normal surface to a text surface, because obviously you're going to want to be able to render text to the sys buffer. And that's it. All right. So now make b-hole move constructible. Now that I've done that, I can now use std move on the whole quad, textured quad, and that allows it to be used in a vector. Yes. Uh, what is this? Surface operator. I delete this operator from here. I delete the operator from there. I'm pretty sure there was some bullshit that happened where it wasn't calling my move operator. It was calling the copy the copy assignment operator. So I deleted it in order to see why it wasn't calling it. And it wasn't calling it because you have to specify your move constructor in textured quad. It will not create a default one for you, even though it's, I think it's supposed to, but Visual C++ Microsoft compiler does not do that for you. And I had to get rid of constant on my surface because obviously if it's constant then it can't be assigned, can't be moved from one into another. Mm, maybe it could, I don't know. Anyways, yeah, so I had to create an explicit move, move constructor here and I had to put an explicit move constructor in here and then I was able to create or, yeah, create objects in my vector without copying them over and wasting a lot of bandwidth. Yes, done. Now my explanation has been completed somehow. All right, so here what we're doing is now we want to be able to load black holes from our DXF file. So if I... Shit, I can't open it from here, can I? I'll show you later. But anyways, the way we do this is in map. Uh, so before, if we found a circle, we just treated that as a start position. But now, if we find a circle, we check to see what the name of the layer is. If it's a start position layer, we treat it as a start position. But if it's the black holes layer, we treat it as a black hole. And we add it to a vector of black holes. Uh, what is this? We add it to the vector of black holes, which is here. So here we got a vector of black holes. And when we're going to test collision, after testing the boundaries and testing the, uh, the track region manager for collision, we test each of the black holes. And when we're rendering, we render the black holes. Game will add a, a remove black hole from game here because now it's part of the map. And Bob is your uncle. Remove it from here, remove it from here, remove it from here. Good. Now it's part of the map. Update map for my b-hole. 
what could that even mean? All right. So before the map was a static object. It didn't require an update, but now black holes rotate. So they require an update to determine their rotation. So I had to add an update function to the map. And then we have to call map.update in our game update model. Oh, we're almost done. I can feel it. I can feel it in my water. All right. Here I change the rotation direction of the black hole because it looks cooler in the other way. What do I do now? B whole universal constants do not need to be initialized in move constructor. So when you're moving, when you move constructing an object, uh, the gravity and the angular velocity don't have to be copied in because they're already constructed in here. Angular velocity and gravity are the same for every black hole. So copy one into the other, it's not going to make a difference because they're, they're all the same. So I got rid of that. I have OCD. Okay, this should be good. Probably something stupid. Oh, I made this I made this float constant. Just because. Fix dynamic cast in track region collision handler. Oh, here I just so here's a trick that you can use for an assertion. Uh, when you have an assertion and it triggers, the message that's given is going to be the text that's in here. So if the text is just true, then that's not going to make much... Uh, I mean, you, the pop-up window for the error is just going to say true, and that's not going to give you any kind of hint. So what you can do in here... Wait. First of all, assert true is never going to trigger. But we always want it to trigger in here, so that was the first mistake I made. The second mistake I made was true by itself isn't very, you know, explicit. So you can put, like, some... just put a string in here, and they do a logical and with false. So this will always be false, but this text in here will show up in the error uh, dialog box. So you'll see non-ship collided with track region. And that will give you a much bigger hint about what fucked up. Instead of just getting a bunch of line numbers and then having to look that shit up, you'll know right away. So I recommend this for your asserts if you want. Especially if there's no like good message. Like if it was just assert false, obviously that's not good. Should pass string by constant reference. So I just changed uh, passing a string in. Uh, this is passing by value. I changed it to passing by reference. Here again, passing by value to pass by reference. No big deal. And a little bit more OCD. Uh, what did what even changed here? Oh, I made I made the uh, I made the save function const because it doesn't change the object. So yeah, that's fine. Okay, done. Super done, and I'm happy. That took longer than I wanted to. My goal was, if believe it or not, 20 minutes. And no way. Well, fuck me, I guess. But lots of, you know, lots of good topics to go over. I regret nothing. Except my throat. Um, let's look at the results, shall we? Please don't, like, crash or anything. Good. Thank you. So here we've got our ship, and it's going to move and move, and then get sucked around the black hole, like, see by bam bam sis boom ba You can't really tell because I was moving too fast. Maybe, if I do this, you'll see how it gets sucked, and then I died. And you can see the black holes rotating as they do, and so on and so forth. And... For those who are interested, we'll go into Solution Explorer, we'll go into Media, uh, Map, Track Test. And here are the black holes on the track, on the black hole layer, as they do. People don't think it be like it is, but it do. I don't know. Anyways, that is that, as they say. Uh, 
I can't remember what the next topic is going to be, but I'm sure it'll be fantastic. Actually, I think it's going to be about making different screens. Uh, so not just having, that's going to be important for not just having a game screen, but also having like an option screen, a menu, a title screen and so forth. So we'll be working towards implementing a screen system next. I think, unless I'm lying, which I might be, because I can't remember. Goodbye.